Father, we give you thanks and praise. Your goodness, your grace, and just the fact that we can know this living God, we can know you in a personal relationship. Pray now, Lord, as we look at your word together, as we're nearing the penultimate time in 1 Corinthians, Lord, we ask that you will speak to us, that you will transform us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm going to have to admit something to you. I don't know what's up with me, but um, I can only tell you this by quote from uh, probably what I would consider one of the best science fiction series that should have not been cancelled ever, but it did after its first series, called Firefly. If you've never heard of it, I understand. If If you want to see it, talk to me. I will lend you the DVD set. You will have the best time ever having a combination of cowboys in space. It's brilliant. But there's a captain in it called uh, Captain uh, 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 Reynolds, paid by the actor Nathan Fillion. And he's about to go and do something really good and really righteous with his crew. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually in the movie Serenity that he says this, which is, was the close-off of, uh, of the series. And he's going to go off and about to do something. They're basically going to go and attack the enemy and, and deal with uh, the problem that's been going on. And I'm not going to go into the story too much. But he comes out with this great line at the end. I love it. He goes, I aim to misbehave. And that's how I feel this morning. <laughs> so I just thought I'd explain that to you now uh, and be fully prepared for the fact that um, Pastor Warren might just misbehave slightly. It will be scriptural. Uh, No, that's it's the machine uh, is saying that we're going to end in one. That's the low. That's the machine saying something I can't, don't want it to say, but it's saying it. Thank you, Denzel. So, and Denzel's already started the misbehavior. No, no. (laughs) One Corinthians fifteen, verse forty-five. We are going to start. But who was here last week? Who was here last week? Come on. You're lying if you don't put your hand up. Who was here during the teaching last week? So you're all scared now because you know I'm going to misbehave. (laughs) Okay, what did we learn last week? Now, I've registered some of your hands going up. I mean it. I am going to misbehave this morning. So somebody better start thinking quickly. We looked at... 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to verse 44. What did we learn? Quick, quick, quick. Come on. You learned something. Without hope of the resurrection, we have no hope. Remember we looked at the resurrection body? The Corinthians, didn't, they had no problem in, in, in Jesus, the risen Jesus being risen and being a, 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 a resurrection occurring. They had an issue with themselves being resurrected. Thought we might be zombies, maybe. Maggots growing out of our noses. Do you remember that bit? I see, you all remember that bit. Remember, we also looked at the difference between ashes, you know, if he was cremated or buried. Somebody this week actually remembered that bit. I was so grateful to them. Should never take God out of the equation in any situation. That was the problem. I think they'd forgotten the enormity of God and what he was able to do. Our resurrection bodies will be suited to the environment we are to live in, yes? Birds can fly. Did you start to remember this now? I was flapping my arms. One of the key things to me also was that where Paul uh, talks about, and I'm just going to read it, he, he, he used the analogy of like a baby who'd been born too early, a premature baby, malformed. And he said, you know, it's God's grace upon me that I became an apostle, that I 
It was, uh, as he says in verse 10, but because I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. Remember, he said he's so grateful to God of the grace that's been poured out upon him to know the Lord Jesus, that his works, what he's doing now, is born out of that thankfulness. It is not he's trying to get God's grace by working harder. He works harder because he recognizes God's grace in his life. And he is so thankful, he's going for it wholeheartedly. Do you remember that? Does everybody remember that little bit? And the challenging question was, can I say that? Can we say that? That we're so grateful for God's grace upon us. We actually recognize our weaknesses and the fact that we are so grateful that we're running out. Or do we, as we said this morning, do we fall into this trap of being so Jesus is my boyfriend type mentality that we forget the enormity of that grace and the enormity of who our Jesus is? We... um, uh, to make reference, funny enough, uh, uh, John, um, uh, Chris was making reference to the house group she was at. It's actually at John Batham's house group. And I actually went along uh, for the first time just for a visit. So the rest of the house group, I haven't got worried, I'm not going to be there all the time. Went along for a visit and it was a really good house group. And uh, we, looked, we were looking at the transfiguration of Jesus in Mark 9. And when you take that moment of transfiguration... When Jesus is turned into brilliant white and, uh, you know, his clothing is, is bleached white and then be done. And Moses and Elijah is there and Peter does his quakey bit like, ah, 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 build three tents. Do you know the story? Do you know something? It really gets worrying when there's a whole, I'm not quite sure which that one is. It's quite a key bit because it looks like you think, huh? But it actually is really important. It's quite significant about pointing out who Jesus is. Especially to good old bluster guts Peter. And so we need to pick up on that. Sometimes our Lord came down, saved us, died for us, and said, you are mine. I love you. Come into a relationship with me. Put your name in there, whoever you are. And it's out of that thankfulness that we work harder for his kingdom. With me? So we're going to finish off. Starting with verse 45. But I just want to quote this bit from uh, uh, Siampa. The resurrection that believers await is not only one that guarantees mortal transformation, but also moral transformation. That we may live a new life, an existence that begins in the present. Remember, this whole story is about the resurrection body. And we got to this point where really we need to recognize that the resurrection means that we believers, what we're waiting for in the end, actually guarantees not just the fact that we will be mortally transformed to live forever in glory with God, but there is a moral transformation in us that we are changing. You become aware of living your life for Jesus, what it really means to love the other. You become aware of how you can actually output to others. I can guarantee you this, prior to you becoming a Christian, you thought you were doing all right, most of us. And then you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit resides in you. What then happens is you then discover all the things that you're doing wrong. Because the Holy Spirit starts pointing them out to you. It's good, isn't it? Isn't it fun? Best thing, it keeps going until the day you die. I laugh and joke about it, but, you know, I don't enjoy it when God goes, but it's part of that transformation and we can live. So we live a new life, 
a non-self-centered life. And it begins very much today. It's not something for us to wait for or to go, oh, that's all right, I'm never going to be totally perfect, which is true. This side of death, you're not going to be perfect, but it's not that you sit there and just go, well, I might as well just wait. It's a futile effort. Because it's not. Out of your relationship with Jesus, moral transformation occurs as well. So what happens now? Well, the next few verses we're going to look at, Paul gives us a contrast between one who lives out of merely earthly power and resources and one who lives out of heavenly power and resources. You ready? So I did bear with me. It's very strange. I've got... What was on the screen was not on here. And I was confused. Right, we're all right now. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. This was so much easier last week when Timmy was doing it for me. <laughs> right, well, first Adam, if you remember, we're all basically Adam or Eve. Adam represents really, depending upon the way you look at it, but Adam really and Eve, so I just want to make sure that we're um, not being sexist. Adam and Eve both represent the fact that we actually will turn away from God naturally. That's what we do. All originates from Adam, i.e. the original sin. And therefore then we are all naturally, line of human beings come from a line of Adam and Eve. Yes? So he talks about Adam here is the fact that that's what happens. Being united to Adam, death is present. But life comes with being united to Christ. Which if you're a Christian, you're united to Christ. And what we have here in verse 45 is, is, is sort of the order of things. The first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Do you understand what they mean by the last Adam? Christ is seen as what was meant to be the perfect human. Really where Adam failed. So he is the last Adam. And it's not really Adam, it's sort of Adam. You need to sort of split the A and the M and the A and the D. And that's what that means. It means Christ is the last Adam. Adam, the last. Adam is also a representation of whom God wanted to work uh, into his creation through. God is never known directly. He always goes through a, a, a sort of an agent, a viceroy, a regent. So Adam and Eve was that initial one, you know, go work the land on my behalf. And they got it wrong. So then he got the Israelites along. I want you to go, or Abraham, you go and bless nations. I'm going to make you a great nation. The Israelites, you're meant to be a great nation. Go and bless others. Go and show them what this Yahweh, this God is meant to be like. They didn't quite exactly do it correctly, neither. That's the representation of humanity working. So then Christ comes along. The perfect, absolutely, this is it. The final one. The final example of what we should have been like as humans in the beginning. Got it? So here Paul is linking something about Adam to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, which reads, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Paul is giving a bigger picture to the Corinthians here. 
we need to pick up this bigger picture. For a starter, God is capable of breathing life into the dead. Now, take that one step further. It's not just about bodies. It may be situations. We've heard this morning some people talking about that just suddenly they find themselves now in a cave, and I know what's going on. I'm just going to be very cautious in what I'm going to say. But where a situation can seem like it has just died, it's all over, all hope is lost, God can breathe life into that. Just think about that just for a minute. It seems so easy sometimes just to say, well, that's it, it's all over. God's walked away from this situation or, or, or that's had it. But God can actually go, no, 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 no. I can breathe life back into that. And where Paul is talking here, about the natural body and the spiritual body and uh, uh, Adam becoming a living person. There's something else he's referring to. Because it's so easy for us to think that the Jews always believed in the resurrection of the dead. Well, back in the Old Testament, they didn't quite have a full formula of the idea of the resurrection of dead. That developed up until about Jesus' time. So if you look in the Old Testament, there's no mention of the resurrection of such of the dead. Sort of like an end time. But there is in Ezekiel 37 which I'm going to turn to. If you want to join me, please do so. Sorry, this laptop still doesn't quite allow me to flick around on um, in books. But I just want to read this to you. It's well known. You see bones, I see her. Have some confidence in the, what you know, my brothers and sisters. You see bones, I see her. I see an army. You see bones, I see her. You see bones, I see her. Do you know that's what God is saying to us this morning? You might look at yourself and see bones, I see her. Do you know what the worst thing is? I can hear more women than I can men. You see bones, I see her. Men, I'm sorry. All right, let me, let me show you how it's done. You see bones, I see her. <laughs> Men, can you stand? I'm being serious. Get on your legs. I aim to misbehave. Just the men. You see bones, I see a... Thank you. Be seated. Goodness me. In Ezekiel, just hang on to that. In Ezekiel, by the way, none of that's in my notes. In Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel was a prophet speaking to the exiles of Jerusalem. They were now living in Babylon in a foreign land under uh, oppression, occupation. They had lost everything that's key to an Israelite. The temple has gone. The land they're no longer in. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. The Jewish people's minds in a complete turmoil. They have lost everything. And this is actually all due to their own idolatry, their own shameful acts. But they now recognize they have lost everything. They have effectively become dead. They are dead people walking. They've got no hope. It has gone. And then there's all this uh, in the whole of Ezekiel. You'll, you'll see lots of God speaking into situations, meeting out his judgment calls, etc. But you then get to 37. Where Paul makes it, um, Ezekiel makes it very clear that they will be reunited, repatriated to your city and lands, all under one king. There is hope. And he uses things like this, and I'm just going to go through the various verses that he picks up on this. 37 verse 6. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. 
Then you will know that I am the Lord. 9 to 10. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and the breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up onto their feet, a great army. I get excited reading that, don't you? Eleven to twelve. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, We have become old, dry bones, all hope is gone, our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, This is what the sovereign law says. O oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Does that not get you going? Verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. That for the Israelites was something. That for the Israelites was something that they, back then, were given hope for. I mean, they saw it as a prophetic message. They didn't quite see it as that they will be risen from the dead. They would see it that they will be raised from the dead of their lack of hope. And they eventually will be returned back to the city. This is where Paul, probably for the Corinthians, is trying to get them to see the bigger picture of what God is saying. So for Paul, when God wishes to breathe his spirit into someone, it will happen. But the difference between Adam and Jesus... Ezekiel 37, forget 1 Corinthians. What we've just read is I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you think that's it, it's all over. There seems to be too much going on. There seems to be too much oppression coming from the outer world at the moment. There just seems to be complete crisis everywhere. There seems to be a crisis in my life right now, let alone the crisis of the migrant crisis. Or maybe we want to think about ISIS and thinking, when's that going to stop? Or when is the church in the UK going to be lifted up and risen again and it's going to be shouting the gospel of Jesus Christ into this nation? Do you feel like that? Just think for a minute. Have we lost the hope in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ? Have we actually lost the power and the strength and the realization of who he is? Have we forgotten the love that he's portrayed and the power he's given to say that I love those people out there and actually believe it for ourselves, let alone to convey it out there? Have we become so timid in our voices that we have forgotten who he is and he will breathe life into the spirit of those who are dead people walking out there right now? That actually we've forgotten that if I just open my mouth in truth and spirit in whatever that looks like. But if I open my mouth to speak to my neighbour, my family, I'm so scared I've forgotten the power of the risen Christ. That as I speak, his spirit will go into their spirit and raise them from the dead. Have we forgotten the reason we're here this morning is because Christ has spoken into our spirit and risen us from the dead. You see bones, I see an army, says the Lord. He's talking to us.
This is a good thing. This is not something to be oppressed about. This is, this is a good thing. When you walk out there, after we leave these hallowed walls into the big, wide world, do we get scared? Do we want to just blend in? Or do we forget we're walking out in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to change situations, to bring hope to those who have no hope, to tell them that Jesus loves them and they ain't got to do anything about it but give their lives to him, to breathe life into them. Have you forgotten that? Have I forgotten that? Or do we just want to hang here and just wait for the resurrection of the dead? I'm just waiting for Jesus to return. I was uh, driving back yesterday from... Um, uh, from uh, from the shops, I was coming down the North Circular, and as I was just driving down, we get caught. You know that fantastic moment as you're approaching Hanger Lane, you're caught in traffic like it's going out of fashion. And have you learnt the trick that you go to the outside lane, and as you approach the traffic lights, it splits into two. You beat everybody else. Thank you, Denzel. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. I aim to misbehave. Right. Got that great moment. That happens. Yeah. Well, while I was caught in that traffic, I was looking at everybody else. And I was thinking, these are people, dead people driving. Why are they dead people driving? Because God's people have forgotten in this country about the message of the resurrection of hope. We've got become too comfortable. There's not enough sacrifice in us. There's not enough gratefulness for the, what God has done for us to pour that out upon other people. And this, for me, enough is enough. And over the next few months, you're going to be hearing more and more of that from me, and not to go into now, but in a few weeks' time. This is not as premature as I like it, but I just feel I could not leave this to go for a minute. So could you please just stand, everyone, if you're able to? Whether you're a member of this church or not, we're all part of Christ's family if we've given our life to Jesus. So could um, this side turn to that side and this side turn to that side? You with me? Marvellous. And we all hate this bit. This is so uncomfortable. Do that half sort of grin. Oh, hee, hello. I'm nervous. If we're nervous looking at each other here, how are we going to do out there? And God says this. You see bones. I see an army. Repeat to each other. One, two, three. You see bones. I see an army. That's so polite. Do you know something? We're a, we're a church made up of 40 different nationalities. Okay? England, English nationality is so polite. Other nationalities, you're polite, but you're exuberant in your politeness. So, one, two. Two, three. You see bones, I see an army. We're getting there. Third and last time. Come on, guys. And girls. Let's give it all it's got to be. You see bones, I see an army. All of heaven's resources are upon us. And they are upon you 
when you're on your own as you feel like you might be and not part of the army. So you, you are not on your own. Please be seated. Funny enough, this is where Paul is getting at about the difference between an earthly person and a heavenly person. An earthly person receives, like Adam did, the spirit of breath from God. And the idea was he was meant to output that then into management of the land, but he didn't. He sort of almost turned selfish and retained it for himself and did his own thing. That's an earthly person. A heavenly person is somebody who receives the life-giving spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just receive life from God and hang on to it for himself. He actually was life-giving spirit. That's what he is. He gave out life. And that's what we do. If you're a heavenly person, notice I'm not using the phrase man. If you're a heavenly person, you are now being breathed the spirit of God into you for you to give out the spirit of life into others. And we live in the hope that someday we will be ultimately like the heavenly Christ. And that's the hope to which we live in. Verse 50 says this. What am I saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. We in the West, it's a fantastic trick. And I don't care what country you've come from. Uh, if you're living here, you've picked up the cultural Western culture. It's that simple. It happens through TV, adverts, etc. It's the fantastic mind trick that says that you've got to live forever now. Retain it now. Make yourself forever youthful and young. Keep your body in a particular way. Keep your hair blue. That's it. Yep. You shouldn't have pointed out. I told you I aim to misbehave. They got pointed out yesterday by, uh, uh, by Joy as I was bending over the dishwasher. She went, ooh, look at that. Can see right through to the skin. I better go and get some, uh, some of that uh, caffeine shampoo and see if I can regenerate my head. No. Do you see how much that stuff is? I did look. I was just cu oh, purely curiosity how much it was. Over five pounds. Please. No, I didn't buy it. I believe that's bad stewardship of my money that God's given. But the trick is, is, is that, that, that keep this body youthful. Try and make it always look good. Yes, you should keep yourself fit. That's nothing wrong with that. Health and well-being is not a bad thing. But, but, but to spending money to make sure that I always look a particular way, that's a mind trick. Our bodies are dying. Amen? The minute you're born, you're dying. It's a really cheerful message. But when you come to Christ, the minute you're born again, you're living. So forget the body. Yes, it's the building blocks of your resurrection body and all that stuff. But look after it. But don't, make his, don't fall into this mind trick of thinking, I've got to spend all this money. Because actually, that's not the right thing to do with our resources. Now, you're all panicking, thinking, should I wear that makeup? <laughs> oh, see, now, you know, that's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it, eh? I know, my eye shadow, I've had to give it up. I don't think God's got a problem with us looking young. It, they put oil in their faces in the old days to keep themselves looking fresh faced and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. But just, you know, is it about my vanity or is it because where I go to work, you've got to look a certain way or else? You know, there's always that, that balance going on as well. A 
And then he wants to give them a lot more hope. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bo- sorry, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For death is the sting that results for sin is the sting the sting. See, the problem is this dying body don't speak properly. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ, and there should be a... There is a wonderment here. Did Paul think that he would still be alive when Jesus comes back? Because you think about it, not all of us, he says, will die. It's one of the early letters. Remember, this is a letter that's written within 20 years of D- Jesus' uh, ascension. That's quite something. And I can understand the mistake they made because of some things that Jesus said that still seems confusing to us sometimes 2,000 years on. But it's fairly irrelevant as to what he thought now. But what he's trying to get at is actually, no matter what, uh, I know there's, um, it was actually on last night on one of the terrestrial programs, um, uh, from the, um, a certain series of books uh, from um, America that I feel one should leave behind. <laughs> I've read them, great fiction. Note the phrase at the back, fiction. Some people take it quite literally, that's what's going to happen. And I remember people thinking, oh, when Jesus returns, there's going to be disasters, there's going to be earthquakes. I don't want to be there for that. I don't want to die in pain or in an earthquake. But according to Paul, when Jesus returns, we'll be tra- if we're still alive, we'll be transformed in an instant. We won't be raptured up. Let me make that very clear. It's a misinterpretation of those verses. One side. <clears throat> but Paul is saying, your hope is this. That everything will happen in an instant. When Jesus returns, we, if we're still alive, our bodies will be transformed. And if not, those who die before us will be raised to life in their new bodies as well. There's something to look forward to. And what you're looking forward to is that, but you live your life today in the light of that you don't wait for that you live what you're doing now today in hope of that and do you believe in the resurrection of the dead do you believe that you will be raised to life amen well guess what they out there need to know that as well and guess who's got that message how are they going to hear it there doesn't seem to be this um, enthusiasm behind it. If we don't tell people, they can't respond to the gospel. If they don't have a chance to respond to the gospel, they ain't going to be raised to life with us, are they? And I know sometimes maybe telling our closest friends or telling our family is the hardest thing to do. And I bet that's probably the one place we're the most scariest to do, is those that we are closest with. But if you live in the hope that you're going to be raised to life, you're not going to be fearful of telling them and what their reaction will be. 
There's a step over sometimes that we have to say. When Jesus said that, you know, I've come here to divide. We think that Jesus here will be nicey, pleasy, pleasy, pleasant. He says quite clearly in Matthew, no, I've come to bring a sword. I've come to divide. My message is a message of division, whether you like it or not. Initially, when it's heard, it will divide you. But it is a message of unity as well. We can't be scared to tell our neighbours. And I'm speaking to myself just as much as everybody else. I am blatantly obvious what I am, what I wear during the week. I wear my clerical collar. Blatantly obvious what I believe or what they think they think I believe. I still have to tell somebody the gospel. It's no good just walking around in that going, ha ha. Because actually they don't know the gospel. I had that absolute fantastic opportunity in the last seven days to be telling the gospel to people of Islamic following faith. And it was a real proper dialogue. Initially I was like, am I allowed to? Yes. Because I believe in the resurrection of the hope. They need to hear it just as much as everybody else does. Because if you're going to believe that you're going to live forever, that actually death is swallowed up, what have you got to fear? What have we got to fear, my brothers and sisters, if we know we're going to live forever? Well, somebody might not talk to me after I've said something to them. Somebody might shout in my face, tell me I'm a fool or I'm an idiot. Because that's all we're going to get over here. Our other brothers and sisters in other countries, where Islamic State is really, really giving them what for, the minute they mention they're a Christian, they might be flogged. A lot might be tortured for days on end. It's not a, a, a shouting at you. This is a, come on, get excited about the power that's in us. The gospel hope that we believe, that we say we believe, we stand in here on a Sunday morning going, and we sang that song, Oceans, where my feet may fail. Let me trust without borders. Jesus here, Paul is saying... That death is swallowed up in victory. Notice this, that death is swallowed up. It's not just defeated, squashed down and removed. It's actually victory has come along and whooped it up, swallowed it and gone, right. You chewed, to, you, you're no more. There is no more death. It has lost its sting. Sin, by the way, is the sting. It's the jab in the arm that causes death. And for sin, verse again, for sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. This law, when he talks about law, it's about the sort of not quite the Ten Commandments. It's that. But it's how people say, well, what you can and can't do. It's a lower L. A small L means it's more like the verbal law that was doing the rounds at the time. Uh, the teachings as such that saying, well, you can't take some oxen to this because we need to figure out what it means back then. It's, they were making things up almost as they were going along, trying to, like we do in the Bible now, we take the Bible and go, what did it mean now, then? So how do we apply it to today? Well, what happened was they were sort of taking things from the Ten Commandments and going, well, what does no working on a Sabbath mean then? Oh. If my cow falls into the river and it's drowning on the Sabbath, do I save it or not? Because if I try to save it to pull it on a particular way, that could be classed as work. Do you see what I mean? So therefore, oh, I've sinned against God. It did make you laugh, really. You think God's got slightly more common sense than, do you know what I mean? It was like typical, this is what the teachers were doing. So what he's saying here is, you're so wrapped up in what you can and can't do that actually you're constantly condemning yourself. And Jesus has swallowed all this up in his power of the victory of the resurrection. 
So, verse 58, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Please can you stand? Can you read this with me? One, two, three. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Please be seated. Oh, sorry, it did say... Uh, be strong and immovable. Why do you all sit down? (laughs) But the point he's getting at when he goes through all of that is saying, if you've got this hope, why do you move the goalposts? Be strong because death has got no hold over you anymore. Be immovable in your portrayal of the gospel message and living the gospel message because death has been swallowed up. Remember right at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, it calls them the saints. You're already saints today. I think John emphasized it again over communion. Today, you are holy people. Today. Chapter 60. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should, put e- should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until they get there and then try and collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along... They can travel with me. Reason, there's one level I don't want to end on this particular part of the passage, but it's, it's in light of the resurrection of the hope that we have waiting for, that Paul clearly wants to respond to a question that the Corinthians have asked about the collection. They know about this collection. This collection uh, for the church in Jerusalem is uh, the Jerusalem seems to be suffering from great economic uh, uh, stress. Uh, uh, economic times so the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem because don't forget all the church in Jerusalem originally were uh, uh, are Jewish or messianic Jews i.e. they're Jew- Jewish people who do believe in Jesus being their Messiah and they're great in economical stress and so what's happening the Gentile churches they're doing a collection of money for them to send to them No different from what we do today where we are meant to, you know, people, things for all these various charity organizations give money to those who are poorer than us. It's the same thing. And what was happening here also was there was a real connection going on uh, between um, Paul, uh, all the apostles trying to say to both the Gentile churches and the Jewish Christian churches, actually you're one body. So by this money coming in from the Gentiles to the Jews, they're saying we're one body, you're not separate. The, Jew, the Gentiles are just as including in this risen Jesus Christ as the Jewish people are. Okay? So that's what that's about. So they knew about this already. They knew they had to be collecting this money. But here, I think it's fascinating that he speaks about this right after talking about the resurrection of the dead. And the hope that you're living for. Why? Because he's actually saying, almost for me, the opening gamut is you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. Make your choice today. If you walk out and go, yes, resurrection of the hope. Right, give your money. Sacrifice for your fellow brothers and sisters in another place. Do you get the point? That's what I saw here anyway.
And Paul is making it very clear that he's obviously going to come along, come back, and needs to collect the money. And he's also saying, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. And otherwise, he's saying, I'm doing universal teaching on this. This is all the churches should be doing this. So where we sometimes think there might be one rule for one church and one rule for another, there sometimes there are universal rules, my brothers and sisters, for each church. Which means there's universal rules for individual believers as well as part of a church body. And financial giving is one of them. He also makes it really great, I think, that he actually puts down some practicality. In verse 2, where he talks about the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of your money. Today's the first day of the week, isn't it? Sunday. Yes? They met on Sunday, so today is the first day of the week. Sometimes these days we say Monday is the first day of the week because that's when we all go back to work. But slowly in our society, that's changing. Most of us work on Sundays. But today's the first day. So he's all saying, at the church gathering, at the offering time, you should give a portion of what you have earned that week to one side to go to the churches. And notice, you make the determination upon what you've earned that week. Back then, this sort of monthly wage concept or weekly wage, I know what my set wages are, has, was not, didn't exist then. And actually in a lot of today, especially with these zero contract hours, etc., or temping, that's true today, is it not? The number of you in here, I know, that do not know at the end of each week maybe how much you're going to have. And so what you do, you do in proportion to what you've earned. Notice he doesn't give up a percentage, but it's between you and God. And that's one of the strategic tips of the leadership team. It's actually everybody should give financially uh, as they are led by the Lord. It doesn't always mean 10%. It can mean less. It can also mean more. And also here, this is for a one-off special project. So there's a portion going to one side for the one-off special project, but he's saying clearly, implicitly also, that your regular giving to the church should continue as well, alongside it. You don't siphon one thing off for the other. And it's good advice. Don't wait last minute, dot com. Do it now. Start putting a little bit aside. The pain is less. How often, maybe when we know there's something we want to do, we we try and put off putting away, you know, the odd tenner or whatever else or whatever we can, pound. Knowing full well we've got something we've got to pay six months down the line. Rather than sort of take a little bit of pain now, we wait and then we get a big pain at the end. It's good practical advice in the Bible. And in verses 3 to 4, Paul expects a delegation to be chosen by the Corinthian church to take and deliver this gift. And he will give them letters of introduction, which goes to prove that the Jerusalem church did not know any of the individuals from the Corinthian church. But clearly they're going to know Paul's writing and an introduction to explain what the gift is for. And actually probably to sort of say, and this shows that you're unified as one body. And at the end of that, he's saying, if it seems appropriate for me to go along, if it seems appropriate for me to go along, um, they can travel with me. He's actually giving the responsibility to the Corinthian church if they think it's, it's appropriate for Paul to accompany them. Paul is saying, it's up to you if you think I can go with them or not. He's giving them some authority in that. I had this whole list of stuff about what have we learned today. But on the grounds of the fact that a whole chunk of stuff I talked about was not originally in the teaching, that's going to be a bit difficult. So you tell me, what have you learned today?
that we should not be afraid to share the gospel. And what have we got to fear anyway if debt has been swallowed up? Amen. I see bones, God sees an army. Could you do that again? And there should be some sort of resounding going on here. I see bones, God sees an army. Thank you, Nanette. We're going to end on that. Please, will you stand? Turn to each other again. And we're going to say, we see bones. God sees an army. One, two, three. We see bones. God sees an army. And again. We see bones. God sees an army. And third and final time that I want one mind-blowing, resounding amen afterwards. We see bones. God sees an army. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Have a blessed week. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.